Hi, and welcome to a new episode of Skills for Mars. I'm back after the holidays with a new episode dedicated to life in outer space. My guests are Sandra Heupling meusberger architect and researcher focused on habitability in extreme environments, the vice chair of the Space Architecture Technical Committee of the American Institute of Aeronautics. And for the second time on the Skills for Mars podcast, Cheryl Bishop, Professor Emeritus at the University of Texas Medical Branch, an internationally recognized behavioral researcher in extreme environments. Cheryl and Sandra recently published a book, Space Habitats and Habitability, Designing for Isolated and Confined Environments on Earth and in Space. It is an amazing read for all space travel passionates, as it pushes us to think about living spaces as enablers for human creativity, adaptability, and resilience. The conversation you're about to listen to is a preview for the book. We talk about designing living spaces so we not only survive, but thrive as human beings, successfully creating a home away from home, creativity and innovation in extreme environments, confinement and how we experience it psychologically, the very hot topic of privacy and sex in space, takeaways from extreme extraterrestrial environment research to improving life and living on Earth. Through this podcast, we are bringing the future of work closer to you. If you enjoy the content, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share your thoughts in the comment section below. Your views and your feedback are extremely important to the development of the podcast. Enjoy our conversation. Hi, Cheryl. Hi, Sandra. And welcome to Skills for Mars. Hi. Hello, Julia. I'm very, very happy to be hosting this conversation between the two of you. And hopefully we get to talk about sex in outer space. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But first, so the audience get to know you a bit better, would you be okay to introduce yourselves? Uh, how did you get into studying habitats out of space? And what brought I'll, you, the, the two of you together? Sandra, you're the one that's got the most experience in studying habitats in space. So you go first. Sh shall I start? Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, well, it was uh, actually by coincidence because I'm an architect and when studying architecture, I was, uh, you know, looking what me as an architect can do when designing spaces. And so I was looking for a way to design and build the architecture in order to make people happy or to make them perform better. And then it was kind of close that the idea is to analyze the situation in a very extreme environment where the dependence on, on the architecture by the users, by the humans, is uh, really necessary, uh, necessary. So I started to analyze and research the uh, relationship between space and humans in extraterrestrial environments from a dissertation at the TU München that I did with Richard Horden. And that was kind of the start, I would say. I mean, I was working on space projects before, but this was the, the start of doing it with uh, methodology and the pathway. And somehow I got also lucky because I'm teaching at the TU Vienna and I have the possibility to do the research, you know, within my job. And I have students that also teach me sometimes and I teach them. So it's an ongoing process. And Cheryl and me met in between, <laughs> um, often, I, I remember that we met in Glasgow and had a really interesting conversation. But, you know, then we got, or we lost contact, or it was it rested, and we got back again and we worked on some projects together until we finally met in Vienna yeah. for a conference, which was the starting point of our book, Space Habitats and Habitability. Right. Uh, I come from a, uh, a different background. I've been in 30 years looking at how humans perform in extreme environments. Um, when I finished my dissertation way back, way back, um, I wanted to study astronauts and uh, my uh, university mentor just laughed and said, nobody gets to study the astronauts, <laughs> you know, and you don't work for NASA, so you're not going to get to study the astronauts. What else are you going to do? And I said, okay. Uh, well, the next best thing would be to look at people who um, go out into extreme environments. They climb mountains, they walk across glaciers, they do these survival things in the deserts and those kinds of things. They're staying in polar areas. I'll study extreme environments, analog environments, because that's the next best thing to uh, 
a, uh, an actual space crew. And so um, that allowed me to look across a lot of different uh, situations, both simulated habitats as well as real operational habitats like McMurdo or, or bases in the Antarctic. And what I was interested in as a social psychologist was how do people adapt to the demands of these extreme environments. And I found out very quickly that, well, um, the actual demands of the extreme environment were not very well characterized aerosolically. Yeah, yeah, you're isolated and you're confined, and but, you know, just stiff upper lip, you know, write stuff, you know, if you're really dedicated to it, you'll be able to, to muscle their way through it. And we already had evidence from space and everywhere else that that was not true. So I thought, okay, uh, that we're really at square one. Uh, what what is different about an extreme environment? What are the stresses that the, an extreme environment brings to a, a group that is uh, trying to live and work in those environments? And um, how can I help them do better? How can I help them perform better? So uh, that was kind of the the approach for my. 30-something years of um, research, and I got to go and study a lot of fascinating groups in a lot of different environments. And I got also, because of all that, uh, I'm multidisciplinary and I'm a generalist, I got to meet a lot of fascinating people like Sandra, architects, I work with engineers, I work with medical people. Um, there wasn't anybody that didn't have something that I was interested in, and so that meant I met... <laughs> I met a lot of people uh, and then later got the opportunity to actually meet them in person and work with them. So it's been a fascinating trip. How did you decide to write a book on this? Uh, well, I, the, this is where my uh, interests intersected Sanders in a very opportunity laden moment is that I had evolved to the point where I'd recognized that the environment that these crews were living in and the, and the extreme environments was as important as any of the training, any of the personality, any of the other things that we could do to help them cope and adapt to the environment. And once I had that realization, that's when I started reaching out to various architects and said, uh, so, you know, what do you all think about when you build a, an envir environment for space or wh what are the features? And, and again, everybody had a lot of ideas, but there wasn't a lot of systems systematic research. Once I realized that uh, the habitat it was as important as anything else, that's where my world opened up to start looking for architects who had ideas about how we could make the habitat um, better. And the whole issue of countermeasures uh, kind of evolved from that whole uh, exploration because I wanted to build in countermeasures that were passive. It's one thing to put a treadmill in, in an environment and say, you have to do X hours of exercise every single day or you'll lose muscle or bone. Uh, people are terrible about compliance. So they're not going to do that. They're not going to persist in that, and they're not going to stay on top of those kinds of schedules. So I wanted to to build the kind of countermeasures for isolation and, and uh, confinement stress and, and s things that support well-being and facilitated interaction between crew members in a positive way, build it in. But I'm not an architect, so I didn't have all that background and the knowledge to say, well, this if we put this feature in here, that will promote long views and reduce the stress and that kind of thing. So um, that's where I got to intersect with uh, Sandra, started our discussion about, well, we should write a book. <laughs> and it's one which is amazing, uh, amazing to read. So I'm looking forward to getting uh, into it. Uh, let me ask you a very general question. Do you think it's possible to have this home away from home that we really feel like it's home? Or it's still a faraway dream? I don't think it's a faraway dream because it has happened already. You know, there was this uh, moment on the Mir space station uh, when the US and the Soviet crews or Russian crews um, had joint missions for the first time. I think the first uh, U.S. missions had a difficult one. Mm -hmm. But then they got this advice, make me your home. 
And then they started, you know, to feel more comfortable. So, and also there are stories from the Sayut space station, for example, when the cosmonauts really got into the routine, which is quite remarkable because it was really dangerous at that time and technically difficult, challenging. But somehow they got in their routine and enjoyed being on board and, for example, turning the space station into a jungle with all the green experiments they had. So I think also what we know from Earth is home is where you, you know, where where your love is, where your energy is, where your friends are, whatever you word you use, but it depends on the personality. This is also where Cheryl comes into it, you know. It's just it's not enough to create a home, but it's this relationship between the people that is what makes a home a home. You know, you need you need the person and you need the the environment to fit. That's the challenging part. Uh, and I think we came to a very early obvious conclusion that um, that the successes that have been had to date in making a place a home. And we have in our, in the book we discuss this whole issue about how you space changes to place, or place changes to space. And, and the the premise was is that if it's a transitory space, then nobody owns it as a home. It's like going to a hotel room, right? You treat a hotel room a lot differently than you do your own home because it's not your space. You're just there for a temporary period, and you're just using it, and you're you're going to go on as somebody else is going to come in and use it yourself. So when we started kind of pulling out these these premises about what makes a place a home, what has to be there for people to feel like it's theirs, it's their space, it's their place, it's it's their environment, and that they not only own it, but then they uh, do things to make it better. Then we started saying, so what makes it better? And and that was kind of like the starting premise of the whole book is that once we realize we we spend a, the first couple of chapters kind of bringing the reader through the whole historical development of the attitude. I mean, because the agency space agency's attitudes were um, it's a work it's a workplace. You know, we don't have to make it comfortable and stuff. We just have to make it functional and survival, and it has to have all the key elements in there. And and Again, it's that whole right stuff, you know, you're you're at work, you're going to do the job, and, and everything will be fine. Well, but humans don't work like that. So um, the, the rest of the book is really about what do we know? We know lots of little pieces of things, but we don't know anything that we can say, ah, this is the best approach because we haven't been able to test out these approaches. If the only place you have to test your principles are in these remote environments in which they're largely operational um, or in space, which is not going to allow you to go in and redecorate, you know, the space station or something like this substantially, then um, your knowledge advances in, in small increments and it's the, it's the accumulation of evidence across many, many different places that start giving us a, a, the, the big picture. Oh, okay. Uh, privacy is an issue. Oh, okay. You know, it. what is privacy? Well, there's all sorts of levels of privacy. So that was kind of the exploration that we followed throughout the whole book. Did you find something that you would like to experiment with if you'd had the opportunity? Something that you say, hey, this is a good model, so... Why not try it out? Actually, yes, and we are actually pursuing it. <laughs> um, in, all, in all this myriad uh, paths of uh, evidence that we're coming in and feeding in, uh, the one that I kind of had started 20 years ago was looking at how incorporating uh, nature in environments makes a difference. Uh, I, I worked with a gentleman, Jim Wise, um, who is an ex environmental experimental psychologist, and uh, he had a he had a NASA study that he did in 1986, in which he sat people in a in a booth, and he had them do uh, 
mental like you know, math problems and these kinds of things. And he had uh, monitors on him to take physiological measures, galvanic skin measures and heart rate and those kinds of things. And he was measuring their stress levels to see how stressed they got. Well, in this booth, in, in front of them, they either had a blank canvas or they had a canvas with these ge geometric figures or they had a, a canvas with a picture of a forest with a mountain and water and or a picture of a kind of a gray scale savanna with the, the like the African plains and the, the characteristic tree that's on the savannas. And um, they, they their premise was is that Stress levels would be best mitigated in when they're sitting in front of the forest scene. They weren't told to look at these murals. They were just there. So this was all passive. It was not the point as far as the subject was concerned. Um, and they found out that, yes, indeed, the forest scene did make the stress levels less, and they recovered faster. But surprisingly, the savanna scene, which didn't have water, didn't have mountains, didn't have a lot of... of foliage and that kind of thing in there, um, showed the best, it showed a 40% mitigation of stress levels, and they had no explanation for it back in 86. Well, then, you know, time moves on, they have no explanation for it, everybody knows that adding nature to environments is restorative, every architect in the world was trying to figure out how to add greenery and, and bring nature in and do natural elements, that kind of thing, but nobody knew why it was restorative, they knew it was so um, a, a number of lines of evidence, the, the biophilic uh, movement began saying, so um, what is it? What is it about nature that's different? And at the same time, there is all the line of research from fractals uh, that it discovered or it realized, uh, which is probably a better term, that actually all of nature is fractal in nature. It isn't just the computer fractals that everybody first knew. And once that realization came into being, uh, the question finally evolved that what if it's the fractal nature of natural scenes that is largely, not totally, largely responsible for the restorative effects that we see. And if that's true, then we can, we can design habitats with these fractal characteristics. You don't have to put a fern on space station. You can design features of space station that have these same fractal qualities and realize the same restorativeness. And that was a very exciting idea because while natural things bring other elements, color and, and you know, the, our associations with the outside, those are all powerful and, and important things too. If we can design the, the actual structure itself to have these restorative elements, then we're way down the road toward making a better environment. And 40%. That's huge. Yeah, that, and that was just with a little bitty mural in front of it. So we have several groups that are that are operating uh, on uh, projects and wanted to to study this. We have a young psychiatrist in Australia, Mark Gerbloom, who is using that premise for his dissertation, and he's putting murals in uh, psychiatric wards to see if it it has a um, distinctive clinical benefit. So we're taking every opportunity that we can to test out the whole uh, biophilic uh, approach. Maybe this is a question for you, Sandra. When will we see this on the ISS? I mean, every picture I looked at on the <laughs> ISS is just full of wires. It's, the space is so little, it's so crammed that I even wonder when and how do people actually relax and how do they relax and where do they relax? Where do they have personal space? I haven't seen any kind of plant, not yet. <laughs> Uh, uh, the interesting, there is uh, many, uh, I would say, interesting levels of discussion. I mean, one level when you, we talk about nature is that, you know, the definition for nature is something that has no, that is natural, you know, something without particular additional ingredients or products. So there is no nature. There cannot be any nature. Uh, so the the whole definition of nature changes when you go to 
the extraterrestrial environment, which is an interesting thought experiment, I would say. Um, coming back to the ISS and to the space station that we have, it is actually very big. It's large. So also from the experiences of astronauts, um, a lot of astronauts um, experience it as rather large because you can use the space, you know, in all dimensions. Mm -hmm. It is, of course, not the largest space station that we had. We had the Skylab space station that was, from a diameter point of view, the largest one that we ever had and where people could really freely move and doing space acrobatics. Um, which is not possible at the moment, mm -hmm. only when a new model is arriving. I mean, just now a new model arrived to the ISS from, the, uh, from Russia. And usually when the models arrive, they are not fully equipped, so it's uh, yep, yeah. empty. Or when a transport model arri module arrives, so the astronauts try and experiment with the space. And then there is one issue that is interesting because... That is also a topic that Cheryl and me tried to look for. What are the differences and what mm -hmm. is uh, changing, you know, from terrestrial and extraterrestrial environment. And there are so many um, behaviors from us coming from Earth that are not changing too much. Even also the uh, environment changes. So, for example, the this rule that the longer you use the space, the more cramped it gets, uh, the more storage you need that you don't have because you didn't plan it, is also true in the, in the, on the station. Very and interesting, because I thought sure, it's hard to get things through, right? I too, the station, right? You have as much as you take with you. Where do the other things? Uh, uh, yes, but over the years, it gets full. You know, there are these images when, from plan, when, they, when you deliver them, they look all very neat. Okay. And then you, you use the computer and you need a special cable. You have a device. You also need a special cable and an adapter for it. And after a few years and after a few astronaut, you know, uh, routines, mm -hmm. things change and you put them somewhere. Things are lost in space. <laughs> And it, it just adds up. And now when you look on the images, at the images of the ISS, it's really hard to see something because it's full. Mm -hmm. It's full of cables, devices, uh, tools. And maybe you have two astronauts, but it's really, that makes it so cramped. Right. And everybody wants all their stuff handy. So it's they want it all stuck there to the wall where they can reach up and grab it instead of have to go over to the locker and open it up and put it back. I mean, if you think about your home, it, your desk and everything else becomes cluttered because you're not going to go put it in the file cabinet or put it back in the closet or put it in the drawer. You're going to lay it there on the desk so you can reach out and grab it next time. And that's the same thing with space as well. I'm curious what's different. Is anything different in, in terms of how we behave when we are out of Earth? Well, the senators already mentioned the, the most obvious one is that in a microgravity environment, you, ha you have 360. Not, you're not limited to a floor and a ceiling and walls. Um, and that's both a plus and a minus because it, you've got more volume. But uh, as terrestrial creatures, we still think in, in that whole gravity orientation. Uh, they uh, at, uh, experimented early on with putting like a workstation on the ceiling and, and, and you know, somebody else down here and somebody else here. And it was very disorienting. Uh, people had very difficulty uh, working a space where somebody was hanging over their head, you know, at, at a 90 degree angle. It was a perfectly legitimate use of the space. But perceptually, it was dis disorienting and and disturbing for people to do that so uh they learned well okay we'll use that for storage because we can't stick people there that's that's too weird you know so uh we carry with us 
you know. Um, on Skylab, one of the, the funny a- anecdotal kind of things that they found is that uh, on the pedestal where they, with the flip out tables where they ate, um, they when they weren't eating, they would put the, the tables down and there was a, an entrance and exit on, on opposite sides of the room. And uh, at some point, somebody in mission control noticed that as the astronauts came in the module, instead of just floating directly over the table and out the other side, which was the linear path, they would come in, they would grab the table, and they would swing themselves around, like make a little detour to go out the side. And they, and they, and they kept doing that. And they asked them, they said, why? Why are you doing that? It's, 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 you know, and they went, well, it's, it's the table. You don't put your body over the table. That's unsanitary. So unconsciously, this space above the table had become sort of sacred space. It's, it's the eating space, and you don't fly over the eating space. So uh, the, it, we carry our, our biases with us, and we don't even know it. <laughs> For uh, for sure. And uh, by the way, I was reading and both related to architecture, but also related to uh, the social life. Uh, in the book, you both talk about micro, micro architecture, but also micro societies. What is that about and how small should we imagine? <laughs> uh, I I, when we talk about micro societies, obviously we're not going down to the microscopic. Uh, but when you only have a society that's made of uh, three people, I guess you got have to have three to have a group. Otherwise, it's just a pair, right? Um, then, then those you. <clears throat> what we found in the extreme environments, especially the teams that stay over in Antarctica, because they're staying over nine months, is that all of these smaller um, Groupings naturally form. You, you, you. If you're an engineer, you kind of hang out with the other engineers. If you are uh, 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 a scientist, you go hang out with the, the people in, in, you know, your domain, that type of thing. When the group is large enough, you have that luxury to form these smaller groups. And and each of you, each of those groups develop their own norms. I mean, they talk about at McMurdo, which is the you know the largest Antarctic base, how you have the 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 uh, the the crew that are the support crew, you know, and you have the military group, and you have the science group, and you have the 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 maintenance group, those kinds of things, and they all kind of sit together to eat, and, and they hang out together for their leisure time, and those kinds of things. So they have their own norms, and their own. Uh, favorite things to do in their own events, those kinds of things. When you have a small group, five or less people, it's almost impossible for those kinds of sub-subgroups to to evolve. However, that means that the few people that you have have to learn how to mesh together. And what happens is that they, in order for tensions to be reduced and conflicts to be minimized, they become more alike each other and less like everybody else back home for the period that they're in isolation. So uh, we get the us versus them phenomena where it's like, oh, mission control doesn't understand us. They're not here. Boots on the ground. We know what's going on. And it's that whole we uh, process to make that group their own little society. They develop their own uh, Events. They develop their own holidays. They develop their own you know, a kind of a little culture. And so while they're there in those environments, those are the norms that are most important. And so micro is less than macro <laughs> as far as the <laughs> psychological side is concerned. <clears throat> How about the architectural side, Sandra? I, I mean, t- concerning the micro society, it's interesting because I had some... It seems like it's a definition within the extreme environment uh, community and space architecture community, because when you talk with a sociologist, they would not call it micro society, but probably small group or milieu studies. Mm -hmm. And that's interesting because obviously it's something very particular to these conditions. And that relates to the space, the design of the space, because um, when the missions turn towards longer missions, 
it became obvious that the the group, the small group, the micro society, needed a really special, particular uh, requirements. And what we have learned is that we do need privacy mm-hmm. for long emissions. So in contrast to camping, some people need privacy every time, but let's say that everybody can, you know, spend a week or two with anyone at any place without, you know, harsh, too harsh conditions or ha- strange things happening. <laughs> but when it gets over a month, it is difficult because you will have some complicated issues to deal with, some challenges, and they all start on a pers- on a you know personal level. But the interesting thing is they require space. So because you have these issues and because there are certain challenges, it is important if you cannot go out mm-hmm. to go for a walk and you know calm down yourself, or you cannot take the phone and phone a friend and say blah 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 blah. So uh, where do they go? What so do they do? The, over the years, it's interesting. There have been different strategies mm-hmm. at the. At the earliest missions where the astronauts and cosmonauts, you know, trained for very long years, it was a very professional approach, I would say. And they would just, you know, give the privacy to the others by not asking them, for example, about certain things Uh or by not putting something on the table that is not appropriate. You know, from from uh, we have to say also from a Western cultural point of view. But now, when we look at simulation missions where people are less trained, and they are researchers, you know, but thrown into a, this extreme environment, uh, usually they find the airlock, for example, works often as a good private space, mm-hmm. anything that is connected to the habitat, like a rover, a greenhouse, a storage model, anything where more than one or two people can squeeze in <laughs> is perfect. Mm-hmm. If the space is then used as a laboratory to make it less obvious for two people, for example, to meet in order to talk about someone, then it's even better. But yeah, it's uh, this is interesting and needs to be taken into account mm-hmm. that we need these this spaces where people can hide, go to talk with others or just be alone. Um, but we also learned that it doesn't have to be a room. You know, it's yeah. most of the time it can be temporary. It can be something where, but where you can go, but it's private in the sense of that nobody can see and hear you. Because all, also we had uh, simulation missions, many of them, where you have these crew quarters that are not sound isolated. Mm-hmm. And then when you talk in the crew quarters, your neighbor can hear what you're talking. And that's also not the, the kind of privacy you need for staying healthy. Right. Is privacy all we need to stay healthy or is there something else? I think privacy is one of those fundamental things. People have to feel like they uh, have the ability to withdraw uh, from social contact. And the the problem with uh, extreme environments, is, is, as Sandra noted, is that sometimes you can't just go out. If, if you're in space, you're just not going to go outside. If you're in Antarctica and it's deep winter, you're not going to go outside, you know, without putting on all this, you know, gear and that type of thing and limiting your exposure. And when the environment is hostile and life-threatening, you don't have the same freedom to escape. So therefore you have to find ways to do so within the inside of the environment, the, the habitat itself. And if the habitat doesn't have provisions for that, it's two rooms and a and an airlock, well it's obvious when two people are squeezing into the airlock to the rest of the group, <laughs> well, what are they doing? Who are they talking about? That kind of thing. So uh it you are severely restricted in your ability to just 
withdraw mentally, psychologically, even physically. And so uh, most of the habitats that uh, get designed on paper are uh, have uh, pay a lot of attention to how can we give people alternatives. Um, whether it's doing the habitat so there's various modules with multiple ways to go from one module to another where you don't have to go down one linear hallway and pass by everybody every single time. I can I can cut through and go through the green hab or I can go around this way. It It's the opportunity to make choices that is more psychologically important than the number of choices that you're allowed to make. And so privacy is one of those things that is it's fundamental to the human psyche. We, we need it. And when it is in small supplies, we get very creative about how we how we seek them out. Um, there was one particular team in one of the simulation habitats in which there was really no place for anybody to withdraw to that. What they would do is they were all working on their computers and they would be emailing or text each other back and forth and having conversations about other people in the group. But those were private because they were on their computer. So we find ways to have privacy, even if we have to kind of carve it out of our uh, 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 usual routine in imaginative ways. How much is confinement only in our heads? Definitely it's a reality as well, but can we move away beyond that reality and actually have a way wider world mentally, even if physically we are confined? Um, it. Well, it, obviously, there's the physical side to it. Confinement is defined by the X number of square footage that you have, right? Um, <clears throat> the perception or the experience of confinement is driven by many things. Um, the, the inability to leave, the number of people that you're sharing the space with. The, uh, I give the example, I said, you know, if you step into an elevator... <clears throat> And it's a bunch of people that you know, and it's very crowded. You're still fairly comfortable. Y'all are chatting. You're talking back and forth and stuff. If you step into an elevator full of complete, total strangers, and they look very different than you do, they're, they're not making any threatening moves or anything. They just look very different than you do. You immediately become more tense, and it's more stressful. And if that elevator breaks down and you're trapped in an elevator full of strangers, much more stressful than if you're trapped in an elevator full of friends. So that whole familiarity and the relationships that you have with people affect how crowded and how confined you feel. Uh, if there's interpersonal stress going on, the conflict, that makes confinement more acute. So the stresses of confinement are driven by a lot of different factors, and that's why it's, there's no one solution that says, oh, if we do this, then they're not going to feel confined. No. We take a little bit of, we do a little bit of this, and that reduces the confinement. We do a little bit of this over here, and that reduces confinement. You know, we, we nibble at it from multiple different approaches in order to reduce the overall impact that being in a place in which you have limited space and you may or may not be able to exit that space at will confers. I think uh, uh, the COVID experience for the, the, the whole world has kind of given everybody a little bit of experience that that, not that we couldn't all go outside, but if we were still confined to our own houses and our own, you know, uh, it, places, then it just the fact that we couldn't go to the movie, we couldn't go to the store, we couldn't go to somewhere, all of a sudden, uh, the house became a lot more confining as we experienced it. Sandra, is there a way to build a habitat in which we don't only survive? Because right now we're basically surviving in the habitats that we build, the outside space, and even though the analog ones that we use for experiments, do we... Can we build those in which we actually thrive, in which we can grow as human beings, in which we can maybe teach others and learn and get better? Because I'm thinking we're getting to Mars, maybe in not such a long time. Mm -hmm. How will they grow there? Because they will have to stay for way longer than nine months or 500 days. I think that was the maximum, right? 520 somewhere there. Honestly, Julia, my motivation is to... to Make architecture on Earth a better architecture. We don't need to move to Mars to say, I, I mean, to learn what would be good because we have a lot of 
housing projects that are not adequate. And we could, you know, really plan, design, build houses here on earth that are adequate. But Maas Amon settlements are, I would say, a good research field, experimentation field. And coming back to what Cheryl said with confinement, um, if you are not confined, you know, because you're a prisoner, or because you cannot, that, that, that I think is also a, a very harsh difference in theory, right, Cheryl? Mm -hmm. The confinement, because when we talk about confined space in space, it's all the confined spaces are because the people are there uh, because of the environment, but not because of the choice. So it's their choice to be there. That is important, the motivation. And then this, this feeling of crowdedness, Yes, there are a lot of architectural strategies that can help to overcome this feeling of crowdedness. And the thing is, for example, in the elevator, what Cheryl said, there is one example made in or coming from Japan, from Japanese landscape designers, that when, one problem with the elevator is that you cannot get out of the elevator, but also psychologically it's difficult to go somewhere else, you know. There is no window where you can say you're, you you look out of the window and you ponder with your mind somewhere else. And the, the Japanese technology that I'm in is called borrowed space that can be easily applied to any architectural environment is a strategy to prolong the fuse. Mm -hmm. uh, over nature, out of the, the window, and by the placement of windows in relation to the environment. And again, what Cheryl said, and I liked what she said, because I want to repeat it, she said, the opportunity to make choices is more important than the number of choices. And that's always important. You have to have the opportunity to get out or to join. If this opportunity is missing, then you have a problem. Or you get stressed, you know, like in an elevator. But if there is a, an opportunity for you to escape the situation that you don't want to be in, you know, I don't know, take a phone call or uh, look out of the window or play a video game or read a book, anything, then it's it helps a lot. So then let me rephrase a bit my question. Because I know you're going all the way to the moon and Mars and uh, through the space stations <laughs> to learn about how we can thrive on Earth. <laughs> so uh, what can we learn from your architectural studies on extraterrestrial uh, space that we can actually bring back home and make life better? Um, that what we have learned is that uh, opportunities are important and it's not about um, uh, the difficulty in this metier is that engineers that are more than architects and designers are looking for answers mm -hmm. but answers you know that allow don't allow too much of a gray option so um, the, there is this wish from humans in our society or in our decade that we would like to know what is right and what is wrong. You know, we know what is right, mm -hmm. tick. This is, and if we have this uh, 10 point list of what is right, everybody will be happy. This, the problem is that it starts a lot earlier and there is not one solution to any, to a problem. Also because the problem is, you know, uh, uh, observed dif in different fields. So what architecture can or shall provide is, again, this opportunity for people that use it to make it their home. That means they need to have some right to change things, mm -hmm. to adapt it to their needs so that the space they use, they inhabit, they work in, uh, fits to their activities. And of course, the architects have to foresee the activities. You know, you plan a habitat for 
six people for a certain period of time and you have to integrate all the subsystems. But then there are, and of course you know what will be the mission and what they will be doing there, but you never know everything they might be doing. Mm -hmm. And this is probably also where we can later relate to the topic of intimate behavior, uh, because this is an issue that is never, you know, put into design <laughs> consideration. There are still habitats with one single bedrooms. You, know, you don't find a hotel on earth that ha when you book a hotel for one person, nowadays you don't get a single bed. Right. You know, there are almost no rooms with a single bedrooms. And But when we look in simulation habitats, we have single bedrooms. Mm -hmm. Pump beds. <laughs> Be, yeah, because I think I I I, uh, I was listening to some uh, YouTube videos. I think that it was forbidden, right? And even couples going into space, married yeah. couples going into space, was forbidden up to a point. Is it still forbidden? Well, there was the one married couple that was on the U.S. mission, but they made sure that the husband and wife were on the the opposite shifts. I mean. Uh, Yes, the the whole uh, approach from all your official agencies is that uh, no, there's no such thing as sex in space. They're, these are professionals. They are there to do a job. They they are they have a professional attitude, and none of that hanky panky stuff is is on the radar. And <laughs> okay, so we're all just send robots and then be done with it because uh, that's the completely unrealistic viewpoint and uh, I mean even in some of the longer simulations the the uh, Russian uh, the, the study done at IBMP the what sync this um, in which the uh, there was the attempt to kiss the Canadian uh, crew member by the Russian crew member that ended up with a fist fight between the two guys what was literally the 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 scenario that anybody who had even put it two minutes of thought to it knew was inevitable knew it was inevitable and the fact that that happened and that there the resolution for that because it was on the ground was to close the door between the two crews and bring in a mediation team to get everybody back on the same page and one uh, crew member left the japanese crew member that's not going to be an option at mars they're not going to bring in a mediation team. They're not going to close a hatch between two groups, that type of thing. So that solution is not on the table. And so they had better be planning more proactively for human nature. And humans need interpersonal relationships. They need the affiliation, and they will make them. I mean, people ask me all the time, well, we'll just send married couples, three married couples, six people. I'm going like, okay. The three couples you send up will not be the three couples that come back, you know, and then you have all that collateral damage from broken relationships. That's probably not a long term absolute, you know, solution to the problem. And uh, we should stop characterizing it as a problem and recognize it as the same human need as we need air. We need, you know, food. We need we need human contact we're social animals and we better plan for that too and i'm so. sure we can plan for that architecturally from a space perspective right Ab you know, right absolutely i mean one of the one of the wonderful things that i uh, really uh, resonated with when i started working with sandra and other architects is that they have a deep appreciation for the fact that you need to you need to plan for and build social spaces as well as private spaces as separate from workspaces. I mean, I had an engineer ask me once, what is the, uh, the, the volume requirement for a person in an, an environment? And I, and I went, what are, you, what are you asking me for? And he said, well, I want to know how much, how much bubble of space do I have to plan for when I build this room and, and I put these workstations in it and, and, and for the rest of the habitat. I want, he wanted a number. And I said, 
for what space? Are you talking about the their workstation? Are you talking about where they're they're sitting and eating? Are you talking about their private space? Because the number's different for each one of those activities. And he got very frustrated with me because no, he had to have one number that fit all spaces across the board. I said it doesn't work like that, you know. So. Architects have a feel for that. They have an appreciation for that, and they intuitively craft their their spaces and those kinds of things, knowing that there's no one number that's going to fit. So I, you know, I have. It's much easier working with architects than working with engineers because architects are are, are more open to the idea that not there's no one size that fits all. So. Uh, Sandra, I see your eyebrows going up, so I'm wondering what you're thinking. <laughs> no, no, I agree totally with Cheryl. Um, I was thinking of it's um, it's really hard to explain sometimes what an arch, you know, what is the quality of an architect? Because if you want to build a house, a builder can do it. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't need an architect if you want to build a. An Antarctic station, an engineering f- company can do it. Mm-hmm. Um, if you want to build a space capsule, yes, it can be built by engineers. But the 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 the, the, the plus why it's important to include architects, I think, is because architects um, have the ability to compose the space, similar to somebody playing the piano. It's not enough knowing the notes. Mm-hmm. It's note, right? Yeah, right. You know, it's not, it's, it's the thing that is between. It's the melody. It's the, uh, the distance between the elements. So it's not enough to take all the elements and put them together in one space. But the composition makes it really good or... Okay or bad, bad right. even, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think of architects as someone who can design some sort of regenerative spaces, spaces that give you energy rather than take it away from you. More on, on maybe on the artistic side rather than on the, yeah, plus and minus kind of side. Can we build this or not? Yeah, yes. Uh, they are, I think good architects are like dirigents, dirigenten. Now they work together with the professionals for the lighting, the professionals for the plumbing, the professionals electricity, the professionals heating, engineers, uh, landscape design. And then you do the composition uh-huh. in to make the most of all these different professions. Uh-huh. And uh, that is also, re- this is happening on earth and, you know, we have very good examples and this is really important also for space and especially in extreme environment where the the, the space that you build is all what you have Mm -hmm. and we 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 try to emphasize that in the book and uh, that one of the key differences in the extreme environments or space uh, habitats is that if you're at home and you decide you know, you're tired of the way things look or you want to change things or something's not working well, it's very easy for you just to change it relatively easily. You go to the store, you get the new couch, you you have somebody come in and put in a new wall. It, the uh, ease, relative ease in modifying what we don't like about where we are, our space, is non-existent to a large extent in a space station or an extreme environment. For one thing, you don't have the materials. If the materials aren't already there, you haven't brought them, you haven't transported them there and stored them there with anticipation that you will that those are extra materials, that they're not already dedicated to something that is absolutely critical. You can't just go out there and use a couple of panels to reconfigure your your social space into smaller units because those panels are supposed to be used for something else. So you have finite materials you have finite capability of making anything different and you have finite people to draw on to help you make those things different so that 
finiteness of extreme environments, all extreme environments, places critical limits on how people can adjust their space and make it more to their liking or make it more functional for their uses. I mean, <laughs> every engineer will complain that, you know, uh, I, I talk about that there's hardware, there's, uh, there's software, and there's wetware. The hardware is, you know, your 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 actual materials, your software, all your computer systems, and your your lighting systems, and those kinds of things. And the wetware are the people, and the wetware will screw up the hardware and the and the and the and the software every single time because they will go use it in ways that was not envisioned. And I have had more than one engineer say that isn't how I designed it, and I said, well. Why didn't you design it for the way they're going to use it? Give it to a five-year-old, and whatever that five-year-old does with your thing, then that's what you should be designing for, because it, you 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 expect the humans to adapt themselves to the tool use, and it's the humans who adapt the tool use to their needs. So yeah, maybe um, the difference between complicated and complex systems. It, um, mm -hmm. Complicated and yeah, and complex systems. So we actually have a discussion in the book about um, <clears throat> crowdedness versus ver versus compli complex. Complexity is good. Usually, complexity uh, is brings surprise and, and and novelty and 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 prevents you with um, lots of different ways to approach something. It's when it's 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 visually crowded or are complicated that then it becomes frustrating because if a complicated system is hard to use then i just get tired of trying to struggle with it so that uh, th they seem like the same words but they're really not they're kind of different cuts at, at what we're trying to achieve here i want to add something because i just thought of you know, do you know the artist esha so there are these two extremes, you know. You have the you can have a container or an Asia space, <laughs> and uh, I I think that the the, the, the the thing is that complicated is something that you cannot grasp, mm -hmm. you know, whatever it is, if it's a space or a topic, and complex is interesting because it's just what you can you know, imagine, and a, a little bit more to make it interesting. And this that it is interesting is also relevant for extreme environments mm -hmm. because they are so closed. So, for example, this boredom and monotony is also an issue. So you need, it's not enough to have a container that works, that is functional, a minimal space. You need a space that is uh, can serve more than just provide the enclosure. Mm -hmm. Because we because people are confined, isolated, they have limited things to play with. Is their creativity and innovation growing because they have to tinker with what they have? Or is it stagnant or even going down? You mean in general? Yeah. In or, from uh, from I'm not sure if you've ever <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm uh, definitely in extreme environments I'm not yeah. because I'm thinking that we do need to get to Mars and there will be things that are unpredicted that they need to solve and they will mm -hmm. not have the right tools whatever they need right it will be very limited so can we be innovative in those kind of spaces after we have it took us maybe 500 days to get there uh, I think that the the answer is yes, and, and and necessity drives a great deal of that. If if you're on the side of the road and you need to change a tire and you don't have a particular piece of equipment that you need, you'll figure out a way to do it if if the if the need to get somewhere is great enough, right? And we we see and it, that's I mean that's really the main argument, one of the main arguments for why do we send humans instead of sending robots. Robots are only going to be able to look at the solutions that they've been programmed to look at. If somebody hasn't thought of it, then that, that robot is not going to be able to do that without external instruction. You put a human in a room, 
And and we call it, we we in psychology we have this term called functional fixedness. And there's even a little experiment where you 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 put a, a hammer and a box of nails and and a, and a brick and those kinds of things, and you tell people they need to hang hang up. Uh, picture. Well, <clears throat> if the hammer's there, most people will pick up the hammer and the nail and hang the picture. We take the hammer away. You have a shoe, you have a brick, you have this type of thing, tell them to hang the, hang the picture. So there will be some people that will look at the table and go, well, I can't. I need a hammer. There will be other people who will pick up the shoe or they'll pick up the brick and they'll take the nail and they'll pound that nail into the wall and they'll hang the hammer. So to the extent that an individual is functionally fixed and cannot see outside the role for the tools and the, and the materials in front of him, he would be a poor fit to go into an environment in which we don't know what's going to happen. Unknown things are going to come up. You're going to have to be creative in the way you approach it. You're going to have to think outside the box. You're going to have to try things. You're going to have to get it done. And that's the point. It doesn't matter how you get it done. It's that you get it done. You need to get the airlock closed. You figure out how to get the airlock closed, even if it means that you're using something that was never, ever intended for that purpose. So, and and to to some extent, um, personality plays a great deal in this, whether you're leaning toward functionally fixed or not. There are other personality characteristics that would make you more adaptable, more able to handle unknown situations as they come up. Um, we have a term uh, from a TV show that in America called, you know, you're, you're, you're a MacGyver. Uh, MacGyver was a character who could, you know, take a hairpin and, and a bottle of water and, and figure out how to, you know, fiddle some gadget that he needed. Uh, we need a lot of MacGyvers out there in the world. So, yes. I wanted to ask if maybe there was something you both wanted to talk about and maybe I didn't ask the question and maybe it would be useful to know either for psychologists or sociologists or astronauts or architects who are working for uh, for these kind of spaces. Um, I think that probably the message that we hope people take away from the book is one of, of adaptability, is that we need to, those of us who are designing it need to be thinking about how the space can be maximally adaptable for the users. If we design for that, if we build a habitat in which you can do the large picture, you can say this is the social space, here's the private spaces, here's the workspaces, here's the greenhouse, those kinds of things. But the, the people who are going to be in those environments, those are the ones who are going to make it the home. Right, we we make a space. We don't make it a home. It's the people who are living there that are going to make it a home, and we need to make the space as adaptable and flexible so that they can modify it to their needs as they see fit. And that's how you transform a place into a home. And so there's all these different approaches and ideas that great architects are coming up with. You know, digital windows. When you look out in a star field. Nothing moves. It's the same. It, so there's no sense of depth. So that would not be having a window that looks at a star field doesn't give us that sense of depth that we need to feel like the space is bigger. Okay, so we put a digital window up there for that portion of the trip, something that gives us a view that is, that lets us look into the distance. These these technologies, these lessons learned from the habitats that we're building here on Earth and that we're experimenting with and trying out different other approaches, those are all the ideas that need to be loaded into our extraterrestrial environments as tools for the people who are going to live there to use as they see fit. And I think the message that we want in our book to convey is that we don't have the answers. We want you to start thinking about this and we want you to think about that goal and all the different possible tools that you might come across that could be lit to that. So, Xander, have you got anything else to add to the choir? <laughs> uh, um, maybe I can add that. Let me first say something to what you to the previous question, to the innovation question, because when Sherry was talking about innovation, and I had in my mind. Of course, you know, the 
astronauts, the cosmonauts, they are trained, selected, you know, they are high, highly intelligent, motivated people. They are all, many of them are really inventors. So uh, they have good ideas and they have the capability to, to match ideas to products. Apollo 13 is a great example. Also the food preparation, you know, there's no kitchen in space, but they invent a kitchen and the utensils. Uh, a funny story is using the Hoover and riding on the Hoover instead of cleaning with it. <laughs> um, <laughs> So there is so much innovation in space happening, probably daily. That, And I've also experienced the other side because I'm teaching 14 to 16-year-old children on the topics of space. And this is exactly the issue or the point where we can say it's important for us on Earth because this thinking, kind of thinking, triggers innovation for Earth. When you have to look for a problem that is not yet solved, a challenge, you know, in space, and you have, we have the technology, but still it's, you know, not the right fit. And this is, the, when you trigger this way of thinking early in the people, those people can do anything they want, you know, they don't have to go to space, but they will be good in any job, in every uh profession so that's that is a point but coming back to through the architect to the architecture we need more architects working in the field more artists working in the field you know we need all these people thinking for the problem and having ideas to make it a very good solution we will not go further far from earth with um, the International Space Station. And I have to say, most of the designs now for the moon and for the Mars, they still um, are not that innovative as maybe designs from the 70s or 80s had been. Now we, ha we, had to, we have to go, we have to be innovative in the way that we have we try to have a more visionary sense of what we want to do and how we want to live. Maybe we um, we really need a grand vision in order to realize the dream. And it's not enough to make it look fancy. You know, I mean, now we had this private space flight. It's super and it's a great endeavor. And everything looks new and fancy and good planned. But it's not space architecture. You know, it's still a ride in a rocket that is safe and is made for the public and made for the comfort of a few minutes. So in, in, in terms of space architecture, uh, we need the architects to work in an interdisciplinary team on solutions that have possibilities, that open up possibilities. And that is valid for Earth, but also in space. Because uh, I see everywhere these prefabricated houses. I find them awful, you know. It's awful. It's, I cannot understand. We, we have this super technology. You know, we can do prefabrication. We can really do less, uh, I mean, more with less material. But why can we not individualize those houses homes a bit in order to make the homes or the houses, as Cheryl said, homes for the people. You know, it's not a box where you move in and um, you hang the, the, the an image on the wall and that's it. We need a bit more freedom for the people. Very nicely said. I think that's one of the, yeah, opportunity. <laughs> opportunity to make it yours. Yeah, and maybe that's uh, maybe 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 we can get them uh, collaborating before they while while they uh, grow to be a team and go to space. They can also design their own space. Right. All right. We we'll start say, or yeah. get involved into yeah. that, so uh, mm -hmm. it can be their own from the very beginning. And like you think about the home that you're just building. <laughs> right. Right. 
So Sandra Sherrill, where can people uh, find the book? And one more time, it's called Space Habitats and Habitability. Where can they find it? <laughs> yes. Does it go backwards? <laughs> Sherry, you are, you are prepared. I know, but it looks backwards in my... It, it, it looks like it's all backwards. <laughs> it, lo it will look perfect. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I... Uh, shoot, you can order it. It's through the Springer site. It's a Springer pub... The Springer's our publisher. And uh, it has both uh, electronic and hard copy available, so you can download it as, as an electronic file if you prefer reading it like that. Um, so, I will put a link to it uh, as well. Yeah, that and for those great. who want to contact you, where what's the best? Is it uh, through LinkedIn, or what would be the best uh, if they want to get in touch and ask questions? Um, uh, LinkedIn is not bad. LinkedIn. I think what is yeah um, Cheryl would LinkedIn sure. be okay or yeah LinkedIn is fine well, I mean I, it's, I just I don't uh, haunt LinkedIn all the time so, so if you go through LinkedIn and I don't answer right away give me a moment I'll get to you <laughs> yeah Perfect. I'll make sure to share the, the LinkedIn uh, uh, links URLs as well, just uh, okay, so people good. can have the opportunity to get, uh, to get in touch. Mm -hmm.